Hello, Mickey Show. Clash momentarily for class solidarity. Cash circulating, give the masses back its currency. Greed from elites, oligarchs, stay fed, deep state, faith fed. Everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion in this melted pot. We live in time to build a new system. Unionize labor rights. Highlight the issue. Talking heads left is best. The saga continues. Continues. The No Miki Show. Hello and welcome to the Nomi Key Show. It is Femme Friday. You love it. I know you do. Uh, it is Friday, October 8th, and we have an incredible show today. Uh, we have Tessa Bridal on, Julie Doubleday, and Rose Adams. Uh, Tessa's on to talk about the dark side of memory, Uruguay's disappeared, children and the families that never stop searching. Uh, that is a book that she has authored, and she is a, she's born and, and raised in Uruguay, and uh, it's going to be a fascinating conversation. I want to start off today, though, about to discuss something that um, is getting a lot of attention, as it should be, and that is, I think, part of the reason why they made this decision. Uh, the Nobel Peace Prize was announced today, and I think, you know, on a lot of these left shows online, you're not necessarily going to hear a lot about Nobel Peace Prize winners. I think that we on the left tend to be skeptical of big institutions and global organizations uh, coming out with, you know, their choices of who they think are, you know, the, 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 the chosen few. But, you know, and maybe this is something that happened after Barack Obama won the Nobel Peace Prize in, in 2008 before he became president. Uh, but with that being said, I think that this one deserves our attention and discussion. The rise of fascism, we are aware of this. We talk about on the show uh, ad nauseum. There are groups out there that have been organized by far right, far right to basically shift the conversation and online so that instead of talking about the issues that matter, we are, of course, arguing with each other, um, attacking each other, and pushing out hate and conspiracies. They are taking advantage of tech, plat tech platforms that, of course, enable this, have been called out for this. Uh, this week, of course, is very notable because of the Facebook hearings, as well as um, Facebook as a monopoly and all of its entities, uh, you know, basically going through a tech crisis, <laughs> uh, all of us being locked out for about six hours. So the Nobel Prize Committee, the Peace Prize Committee, has awarded the Peace Prize this year to two journalists, Maria Ressa and Dmitry Muratov. Now, why does this matter? Well, I think there's a lot on the anti-imperialist left who would say, you know, they're, that we're, we're, we're extremely hard on Russia, Russia gets, you know, inflated or it's not a thing, or that, you know, the U.S. is guilty of, of horrible humanitarian crimes. I think a lot of this is true, right? But one thing that I could never never made sense to me when I would get in these debates. Um, I'm remembering a debate on TYT when I was there at the Young Turks where Cenk Uygur and myself were arguing with um, two of our colleagues about Russia Gate and saying, you know, all of this might be true that, you know, that CNN is inflating it or, or, or Rachel Maddow is spending way too much time on Russia Gate or that it's an excuse for the Democrats losing uh, horribly in 2016. But two things can be true at once. And I think there's one issue in particular that no matter how much we shine a light on the U.S. And, and the injustices that occur on our land against people of color, indigenous people, stuff that we talk about the show all the time, the, the misogyny that's growing, the far right, uh, you know, the fact that, that media institutions just give a pass to the far right all the time and lock out the left, uh, the fact that we're imperialist and we have, you know, we still have operations globally that are impacting people and and, and we, we turn a blind eye, blind eye to injustices in the Amazon. You know, there's a list. We know these issues that we face in our own country. And that's why I think it's important that we on the left continue to push our government to do better. With that being said, while people might get deplatformed every once in a while or might be demonetized, although I do think that happens more uh, with hate speech, um, and while the algorithms might benefit certain types of people, white men uh, on the right, more so than, than others, people of color and women um, and trans people. 
With that being said, I am not in danger when I walk outside of my apartment of being shot because of my reporting. And I have actually done some dangerous stuff, as you guys know. If I had uh, investigated the Democratic National Committee or a major party or, 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 or Putin's party and the finances, and I had released that, I would have had a target on my back in Russia. If I had done the type of reporting that Maria Ressa did in the United States, I would have been fine in the US. But the type of work that Maria Ressa does in the Philippines puts her at risk. So the Nobel Peace Prize Committee, when they decided to award the Peace Prize to two journalists who have done incredible reporting, challenging their government and exposing their government, that to me was a signal of just how serious this rise of fascism is. You cannot have a democracy if you are not able to speak your mind. Are we a pure democracy? Of course not. We're a corporatocracy. But at the end of the day, I am not put at risk. We are not put at risk as journalists for doing our work in this country. Doesn't mean there are some exceptions, but the reality is hundreds of reporters in Mexico have died in the last couple of years for reporting. It is not safe to report in Mexico. It is not safe to report in the Philippines. It is not safe to report in Russia. And there is no spin that, 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 that pulls away from that truth. I urge you to look up Maria Ressa's story. I heard an incredible um, interview with her a few years ago. It was about an hour long where she talked about how she individually went through Facebook and tracked, this is before I think they had tools for this, tracked the trolls that were trying to shut down their reporting for her uh, reporting group. That she literally with a group of people would go one by one and monitor and figure out where they were from. And that by looking at the patterns, they figured out that Duterte, the, 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 the dictator there essentially, was backing this, that, that his party, that his group was backing these trolls. And that happens in the US, of course, but add to that, not just the harassment that she faced, but when she walks out the door, she's had, had her life put at risk. But I think what is so powerful about these two, and her in particular, is that she has challenged Facebook. She has said, Facebook, you could do more. You know more. You know the data. She had to actually write it down. Meanwhile, Facebook turns the other way. So the fact that this came out this week, uh, as Facebook is being challenged, as, as we're having stronger conversations, these conversations have already happened, but they're stronger. The voices are stronger about what it means to have a free press and how that is tied to having a better democracy. What it means to have the ability to report and not be put at risk or not face harassment because, okay, she faces harassment and she's facing, her life is in danger. Her colleagues have been murdered. His colleagues have been murdered. Dmitry Muratov built his organization, his news organization two decades ago because one of his colleagues was murdered and they have not been able to solve who murdered her. That is why they do what they do. On our side, we face harassment and we need to do better. Women in particular face harassment. And let's be clear, it's not just coming from the right. Of course, centrists, of course, uh, corporations will do all they can to make sure that our voices, anybody who's speaking out against them or exposing what they're doing or who's funding them. Of course, those reporters are, are, are suddenly, suddenly they're not getting the clicks anymore or they're getting harassment or there's trolls coming out or they're losing Twitter subscribers, or they're just uh, Twitter followers, or they're not getting as many Twitter followers. All of that is, it's not about popularity for, for, for people who do this kind of work. It's about reach. It's about reach. So, you know, this is the kind of stuff that we talk about on the show all the time. Um, I think this was a very bold move by the Nobel Committee. I think it's an important move. Um, I think we, as on the left, need to remember that these are these are not like exercises. These are this isn't like a d debate in class. This is about lives. And when there are reporters in countries 
that have <laughs> major weaponry and have, uh, you know, have, have, have fascistic elements, whether it's Duterte who rose to power in 2016, his popularity was in part fueled by his use of Facebook. We have to be conscious of that and see how they're doing things and what challenges reporters there are facing. Because we do have a version of that here. It is a much lesser version, but we do have a version of that here. But again, these are not debates in class. These have real life consequences. And I think sometimes, sometimes on the left, sometimes on the left, we treat this sometimes as a debate in class, these global conversations. And part of that is because of our privilege of being in a country where we are able to have these conversations out in the open without being put at risk of our lives. All right, we have a wonderful show today. We will be right back after a quick little break to discuss Uruguay and the disappearing children and the families who have been searching for these children and not stopped. Uh, we have Tessa Bridalon who's gonna be talking about her book. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. Tessa Bridal is the author of The Dark Side of Memory, Uruguay's Disappeared Children and the Families That Never Stop Searching. She was born and raised in Uruguay, and she's a third-generation descendant of a resilient and courageous Irish woman who boarded a ship she believed was sailing for Boston, which is incredible, only to discover once she was on the high seas that she was actually heading towards Buenos Aires instead. She completed her ancestors' uh, journey by immigrating to the United States. This is, this is Tessa Bridal in her early 20s. Uh, and she studied acting and directing in London and settled in Minnesota. What a story. Uh, to become artistic director, director of the Minnesota Theater Institute of the Deaf, where she became prominent in sign language. Uh, this is an incredible story. Um, and she's, of course, a recipient of American Association of Museums uh, Educators Award for Excellence for her work in creating educational theater programs. Uh, she's also worked in the Indian Indianapolis Children's Museum and the Monterey Bay Aqu uh, Aquarium. But this story, I think uh, many folks are aware of what happened in Argentina. Uh, there have been you know, movies about it, but I, I think the fact that Tessa's background is working with children in many ways, this is and in and, and families, this is a, a a different perspective. And it's, you know, one of the reasons why I think it's really important to have um, different types of voices talking about these issues, not just, you know, political historians all the time. Uh, Tessa, thank you for joining. Thank you for having me. Okay, so this I think probably our audience or some of our audience is aware of 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 the children that disappeared in Argentina. I was not aware of the fact that this it, these 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 searches these um, investigations were still going on, and that it also happened in Uruguay. Can you kind of uh, for for folks who are just not familiar with the time period, what was going on? Maybe just give us a basis of of what was happening uh, in these two countries during that time that led to the disappearance of so many children. Well, the Uruguayan children who disappeared all disappeared in Argentina. And the reason for that is that Argentina was the last democracy left standing uh, in the southern part of South America. Brazil, Chile, everyone else had gone under a military dictatorship. And so when Argentina remained as the only one and Uruguay also fell to a military dictatorship, a lot of Uruguayans who had been involved in, in, um, in a movement uh, to change things politically in Uruguay sought refuge in Argentina. And many of those uh, were young couples who had children. And uh, when they were arrested, which was fairly common, um, they would break into, the Secret uh, Service would break into homes at night, typically, and they would take... I'm sorry to interrupt. The, the, which Secret Service would, would break in? Argentina. Argentina. So they were working with... You know, who, who were they working with when they were targeting? I mean, why were they targeting um, folks from Uruguay rather than just Argentina? They were targeting anyone who was perceived to be against um, the dictatorships. And it didn't matter where they were from. 
Um, and a lot of Uruguayans were at that time living in Argentina because it was perceived as a safer place than Chile or because um, when they first started to emigrate to Argentina, it was still a democracy. But once it fell as well as uh, all the countries surrounding uh, Uruguay and Argentina, then it was just as dangerous, if not more so, to be in Argentina than in Uruguay. But by then, um, no one could leave. So uh, the parents were typically arrested um, in these nighttime raids where they were taken to a number of secret torture centers that existed in Argentina. And if they happened to have children, those children were pretty highly valued. They, um, they were very often uh, under the age of two or three. Um, and there were certainly always plenty of families who had not been able to have children themselves. And, um, and the Secret Service of Argentina and the police and all the people who were involved in arresting what they perceived to be um, terrorists uh, would give the children away. And um, very often to families they knew. And the children essentially then disappeared because, of course, they were not registered anywhere. There was no official adoption process. They were just uh, somebody was called and said, here, you want a baby here? We've got one. And um, and the, the child would disappear. And then um, the remaining families, which very often were mothers and grandmothers and in Uruguay, learned that their son or daughter had disappeared and that so had the grandchildren. And so they would go over to Argentina in an attempt to um, to find uh, both their children and their grandchildren. And very often there, there has been, the bodies have not been found of most of those parents. But the children, in some cases, in several cases, have been. And those are some of the cases that I, that I write about is how did it happen um, and how the children themselves then adjusted once they learned at different times of their lives. So one of them didn't hear that, he, that this was, had happened to him until he was in his 20s and how they responded to suddenly finding that they were not part of the family that had they had that had raised them um, so it it was a very uh, very heartrending and long battle and the mothers and grandmothers who fought it were uh, in some cases part of the uh, mothers of the plaza de mayo which uh, a lot of people have heard of and it, they were pretty extraordinary they marched in front of the presidential palace in buenos aires for decades for decades trying to find their children and then um, and grandchildren and then the DNA came into the picture. And when DNA came into the picture, then that was most helpful because people could not say, no, no, these children are, are ours. You know, no, they had DNA. All they needed was a blood test and they could prove who their family was. So um, I have so many questions. Uh, how many, was there a sense when this was happening, when the, the, the protests started happening, um, of how many children just disappeared? I mean, what, were they able to track it? Uh, did the government acknowledge it? The government was very reticent. Both the, um, particularly the Uruguay government, was very reticent to acknowledge that any children had disappeared. Um, and it's interesting that the number is not exact for several reasons. One of them being that very often uh, the 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 parents had died um, in the in the torture centers, and so there was no trace possible for these children. And sometimes babies had actually been born in the torture centers, and so when that happened, then the mother typically disappeared completely and was murdered, and the child uh, given away to someone who wanted a baby. Um. Okay, so the numbers so, are not accurate, but roughly... Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, sorry, I'm coming back to... That's why the numbers are not very exact, because there are still children missing, and um, there are bodies that have never been found of the, of the parents, so it, it's hard to come up with an exact number. But in Argentina, approximately 
approximately 20 Uruguayan children disappeared that we know of. Oh my goodness. So this is, it's so fascinating with the, with, with, with the DNA aspect of this. Um, you know, is it like the, when we say DNA, I mean, the DNA has last two decades, three decades, I think we've been, we've been using DNA to solve mysteries, but uh, these, these new apps, right. These new tools where you can send, you're just curious. I found out I had a cousin that I didn't know if was given up from adoption uh, during the coup in Greece. I mean, it's so funny that you're saying this story. It's, it's not the same, but, but I learned that through one of through 23 and me, are they learning it through 23 and me? I mean, because how would you know to test your DNA if you, if, if you didn't know that you were a child that was given up or, or maybe they were totally adopted, how, what are some of the stories of how these people find out? Well, these um, the stories go back to long before there were any of these apps or online programs or ways that people now can indeed um, track families that perhaps they knew nothing about. Um, this was happening when DNA was fairly new. And what uh, the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo recommended to anyone who had a missing relative, that they had their DNA test done and put on record so that when anyone came to light who was either a grandson, a nephew, a, a daughter, whatever, they could test that child or in some cases that adult and match with the DNA on file. Now, in, in later years, like more recently in the last 10, 15 years, I don't know of any cases that have happened other than through that method. Um, I, I don't, I know of people who have searched for, for um, relatives through those means, but not because they were disappeared. It is definitely more common in, in the U.S. Uh, too. That's a, that's part of this. I think that folks yes. may not be aware of. It's, it's it's harder once you go back. Um, right. I'm very curious. Like I, I know every obviously every family the, the story is a little bit different. But of of the children or now adults that you profiled, had any of them had a grapple with the fact that you know they came from this background where their their parents were essentially revolutionaries in, in, in a sense. And, yeah. and they, I'm assuming that many of them were, were probably given to families that were not. All were of there them. like political, uh, you know, was, was there any sort of like political comfort? Was there any sort of story where a, um, one of the children was, 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 you know, had a more conservative political uh, mindset and now was, was their whole world was shook up or maybe they grew up in a, in a conservative home and they always knew that they weren't like that. Well, there is one case that is very, very famous um, where the, the child's parents both disappeared when the home was raided and their bodies have never been found. The little girl, Mariana, was 18 months old at the time. And she was given to uh, a couple where the father worked in the Secret Service and was probably responsible, if not directly for her parents' disappearance, certainly for others. And um, she grew up in that home believing she was a member of that family, a child of theirs. And it wasn't until she was in her early teens that her grandmother was able to track her down, thanks to the work of the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo. And Mariana initially absolutely rejected any thought that, that this was could possibly be true of her parents, who had given her a, a good life, uh, loved her, yes, were very conservative and all, but so was she growing up. Um, and it was a very, very traumatic experience. And her grandmother, who because her daughter and son-in-law remain disappeared, they have never, their bodies have never been found. Her grandmother um, actually thought at one point of actually kidnapping her, taking her back. And she resisted. She said, no, she wanted to do it the legal way which was with the blood tests, with all of the, the legal things in place to be able to claim her granddaughter. But Mariana absolutely rejected it. She had no interest in having anything to do with her grandmother or with her Uruguayan family. 
So this went on for for a number of years. And one of the more um, harrowing stories, in a way, that Mariana told me once she had accepted uh, what had happened, is um, she would never, never gave up on the family that had raised her. They were, to her, always the people who had been her parents. And um, she, How old was she? at this point, um, she was about 18. And um, now she's in her 30s. But she, um, it, when she was getting married um, in Argentina, she was marrying an Argentine man. And she wanted, at that point then, to start including her Uruguayan family, her grandmother and others, into things. So she uh, insisted that at her wedding, both families would be present. The family that had raised her and her grandmother and, and cousins and aunts and so forth from Uruguay. And I have tried always to imagine what Esther, that grandmother who I spoke to, what she... She said she did it for Mariana, of course, because she loved her. But what it must have been like to be sitting in the same church and then in the same reception as the man who had fairly certainly killed her daughter and, 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 son, in, and son in law and then kidnapped her grandchild. They were all together and somehow they went through it without, um, for Mariana. Mariana said, because they love me. Did um, how is how is the family that she grew up with uh, dealing with her acceptance that she was indeed still? Do they deny it? Do they? You know, I did not have an opportunity to um, interview them. Both of them had died by the time I began some of the more in depth research into Mariana, but. Um, I, I can't answer that really because I never spoke to them directly. All I know is that uh, Mariana speaks very highly of them. She loved them. She felt she had a very good upbringing. And to her, she has two families. She has the family in Argentina and her blood relatives and family in Uruguay. Well, I can imagine, I mean, psychologically, it's even just for preservation of, of uh, you know, your, your entire existence is being called into question and you're, yes. it's, 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 I can understand where she's, why she's protecting herself uh, for yes. that reason. I want to go back to just how her grandmother found her though, because mm -hmm. I, I think the DNA stuff, is, it's, it's still a little confusing to me that, that, okay, so the grandmother found, figured out that her daughter her granddaughter was with this S, this the Secret Service um, mm -hmm. family, uh, family. Mm -hmm. but if the granddaughter had, how did she find her? If the granddaughter didn't provide DNA, what what, what led her in that direction? It was uh, quite a, a complex process, but by then the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo had a whole organization set up for if someone reported and said, we think this child perhaps, you know, was not really belonged to that family. They had a whole process of going through the courts, uh, which by then were established after the dictatorship and, um, and re requiring that the child be given a DNA test. And if the child was under age, they could go ahead and do it. If the child was already of age, the child could refuse. But Mariana's uh, tests began when she was underage. And so the judge required the DNA tests. And it was through those tests that they knew for sure that that's who she was because her grandmother hadn't seen her since she was 18 months old. But uh, the courts were working by then and it took years. It took years, but finally, uh, you know, it all came out and, and it was acknowledged that Mariana was indeed um, Etero's granddaughter. Were there any stories that um, were not as, as, I mean, this is, I guess, as happy of an ending you can have in a situation like this, but were there, were there any stories where um, the children refused to accept it, uh, just, just... I don't know of any where the children refuse to accept it categorically and forever. 
Even Mariana came around in the end, and um, there is one wonderful photograph of her and her grandmother in one of the protest marches in Uruguay that is held every year for the disappeared. So she eventually did come around, but never ever it spoke in any other way except a loving way about the family that had raised her. And and how about the families the uh, that took these children, whether they're from Secret Service or not? Um, have they protested back? Have there been any? Um, yeah, most yeah. of them were arrested. Um, uh, but Mariana's father um, was in prison at the time I spoke to her, which was only two or three years ago. For for, for taking her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and for all his other activities in. Yeah. You know, in the Secret Service. But yeah, he, he was in prison for the second time. And her mother had been in prison too, her, you know, not her real mother. But um, yeah, Did she... by then, things had turned around, kind of. But I, it's she, interesting. Never, she visited them in prison. She never spoke against them, ever. Did she have different beliefs than they did? Did she have a sense that what they did was wrong? Was she acknowledging that? It's very hard for me to tell. Um, very difficult for me to tell because her loyalty to them was mm. was absolute, and she um, she loved them. She had grown up with them, and she she loved them. So uh, I was. It was very difficult to tell what exactly her her feelings about. She she maintained a certain reservation about her feelings. She was very open about the factual stuff and all of that, but her feelings, and I can understand why. She she may even still be working through them. I, I don't know. Mm. But her um, adoptive father was in prison at the time I talked to her, and we didn't go there. I just wow. um, raised the question as, you know, diplomatically as I could, and she just said, yes, he is. And that was that. Fascinating. Um, mm-hmm. How about some, you know, any other stories that, that stood out that really surprised you? I mean, what's so interesting is these are uh, his seismic moments in history, right? But mm-hmm. they're so revealing of, of, of how humans process yes. trauma and, and identity and love and what, what it means yes. and family relationships. Yes. Was there, were there any other stories that really stood out to you that kind of highlight the, the way that we humans, you know, process these events. Yes, yeah, I think all of them in their own way did because they all uh, were found at different times of their lives. Some were children, some were adults when they were found. Yeah. And um, it was just, each story was so unique. Um, the only thing I think that they have in common is um, that they would all admit that there was deep trauma involved, that they had a lot to work through when the truth was revealed to them. And most of them, Mariana was a bit of an exception here, but most of the others suspected that they were adopted. They might not have suspected anything else, but most of them suspected that they were not blood relatives of the rest of the family. That's fascinating. Wow. Mm-hmm. For different reasons. They just... For different reasons. For different Had any of them been told that they were adopted and, you know, and never told anything Not directly, else? no. It was during those days when one didn't tell children these things. Yeah. And, um, and in Argentina, this came about even later than it did in the United States. So, uh, no. And uh, unfortunately... I was never, you know, part of any conversation that involved both sides at the same time because um, people had died, the children were grown up. Um, it was really, but it, it, it was a never ending revelation. The, the other child who um, was not a child when he was found, but he was three weeks old when his, his mother was arrested and he was given to a family that wanted a baby. And um, he did not find out uh, it, with any proof uh, who he was until he was in his 20s. Mm. And um, he is a very remarkable man, a very remarkable man. He, um, he left the home that, of his adoptive parents as soon as he found out. 
but he did not completely cut ties with them. He just, he was very, very conflicted that way. He his he was also in a very special situation because he was the only disappeared child who was found who still had a parent living. His mother was still alive. Oh my goodness. And so they, it took a long time, but they've established a very warm relationship. And his mother was there when, his name is Simon, when Simon's son was born. And uh, so their case is even, is, is tremendously complex as well. It's hard to, um, sometimes to tell the, the pertinent parts of it <laughs> because the stories are, are so interwoven with so many emotions, so many sometimes lawsuits uh, that were yeah. filed against them, uh, government changes, uh, judges who uh, helped a lot in some of their reunification with their families of origin and almost served as mentors to some of these um, now teenagers who just were suddenly found themselves in this completely unexpected situation. Um, with, um, families. with Simon, uh, is, does he, did he just completely cut off ties uh, with his, no. his... No, 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 he didn't. His parents are both, his adoptive parents are now both dead, but they died during this whole process. His father never recovered from it being revealed to his son that he had how he had acquired Seymour's. And uh, he never recovered. He didn't live long after the revelation. He, he died of a number of different illnesses. And he, the, his mother I know less about, but I do know that she died uh, before her husband as well. Oh, my goodness. So, and then the, 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 his, his living mother, his actual mm -hmm. mother, his birth mother, um, did they ever meet face to face? Oh, the yes. Family? Oh, yes. The families? They have. Mm -hmm. Yes, they they oh, visit okay. each other. He visits Uruguay because she lives in Uruguay and he lives in Argentina. No, I mean, but I mean, his, his adopted parents and his, oh. his birth mother. Oh, no, 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 they never met. Yeah, I can imagine that would have been yeah. completely true. No, the courts were very mm, diplomatic about that kind of thing. They, they yeah, no, they, they never met. Oh, my goodness. Um, I guess my, my last question is, have, have, were there any children, now adults, uh, who, once they learned that they were disappeared children and, and stolen, um, did they realize, did, did, some, did the pieces start to come together where they thought, I never, and not just that they maybe thought they were adopted, but mm -hmm. they, were, they felt that they were different from their parents, meaning mm -hmm. it is... This is this is nature versus nurture, but there are some things that sometimes you say. Mm -hmm. yeah, I have a little bit more, you know. When I met my cousin, I can only speak from my personal experience. Mm -hmm. um, he's in his late forties. Mm -hmm. I met him for the first time two years ago, and I sat down with him at dinner with my dad, and he's telling stories about his childhood and you know driving fast cars and I'm like, and you know little things. And I'm like, this is my father. Yeah. This is my uncle. Mm -hmm. We've never met you before. This is clearly nature. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine that there must have been some some of that in being raised in a family that is very politically different than your birth parents. Did any of them sort of say, you know, I didn't believe in what they stood for or I wasn't that conservative or? No, I think, um, I think all of them had kind of absorbed mm -hmm. the, the family that they thought they were a part of. And that included political beliefs. Interesting. However, um, two of them went on to become human rights attorneys. So even Mariana, who um, speaks, will not speak one word against her, the, the couple who took her, um, even she is working, you know, uh, in a field that tells me that she has had some thoughts about what happened uh, well, obviously about what happened to her, but I mean, in terms of what, how she can now contribute to, to a better world, let's yeah. say. Mm. Really an exceptional story. Um, uh, how did you gain interest in this? I mean, you're from, you're from Uruguay, but, but, but what, what was it about this story that, you know, you just knew you had to research and find these, these children and tell their stories? 
I think it was the children, but it was also the fact that I have a, a friend whose two children were born while she was under arrest, but they were not given away. Hmm. So, um, but they were born in Uruguay, wow. not in Argentina, in an Uruguayan prison, not in an Argentine one. So they were given to real relatives, you know, relatives yeah. of my friends. Um, I also have a couple of cousins who um, were tortured and, uh, you know, were in prison at this during these times um, and many, many friends and acquaintances. So I, I, although I wasn't living in Uruguay at that time, mm-hmm. I visited regularly because my family was still there. And, and so I would hear these stories. And, and at the time when I first started learning about them, it was not very well People were a little cautious about sharing their stories. I I was staying with my dearly beloved brother and his wife, and he has always been very protective of me because he's 18 years older. And um, he was very nervous about me going out to conduct interviews. Very, very nervous. And I wasn't perhaps as sensitive as I wish now I had been to her, just how worried he was. But nothing happened, fortunately. Right. Nobody, you know, came after me in any way whatsoever or tried to stop my investigation, not at all. But he he was very concerned. And it's one of the things I say in, in the book. Um, there's a saying in Uruguay is somos pocos y nos conocemos, which means there are very few of us and we know one another. Mm. It's a small country of about three and a half million people. And I would say it was an absolute, if, I, I never met a family that didn't have somebody mm. on both sides they might have had somebody who had gone into the military and then became part of a, of the dictatorship. They might have known uh, the family doctor might have been somebody who was also called in when torture victims needed medical care. One of their relatives might have been arrested. It was very, I never met a family that didn't have somebody affected by what was happening during these years. So, um, Yes, I'm sorry, I've rambled a little bit. No, I haven't answered your original question. You did, you did. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it, it's, um, it's, I mean, it, I think you sort of answered my next question, which was, were there folks who, who up until maybe recently, denied that these events ever occurred? But, I mean, the fact that so many families had both sides, it's... it's I don't know that anyone actually denied that the events occurred, but... Um, the military that I uh, interviewed always justified it. Mm. They thought they were in the right. They were protecting the country against what they called subversive elements. And um, I never, well, obviously I didn't meet all the military, but among the military that I interviewed, none of them would, would say, well, maybe we went too far. Because in Uruguay, it was never quite as terrible as it was in Argentina. It was bad, but Argentina really, and Chile, it was much, much worse. Um, so I, it's hard to know. It's hard to know. I, I had a, a, a friend, as a, a childhood friend, who went up to, who went on to become a, a colonel in, in the Air Force, actually, not the Army. And to, to this day, he, he's completely open about, you know, what his involvement was, what he was called upon to do. And the fact that, and it never involved torture, by the way, but other things. And, and he still maintains that it was necessary. The country was, was under threat from these uh, revolutionary subversives and uh, they had to step in and stop it. From these book readers. <laughs> <laughs> I always love it when, you know, every time I hear the, 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 these military, they go, oh, we're under threat. You've got all the, go- <laughs> what are you going to do, throw books at you? <laughs> like, come on. Yeah. I'm but sorry. they say the country was under threat. Not so much they themselves, but the right. country was about to be overrun by these extremist people yeah. who would ruin everything. 
who wanted to make sure people had food and water and clothing and housing. Tessa, sorry, I just want to loop back a little bit, but really what uh, what moved me always was whenever I was doing these interviews was when they involved children. Mm. I just, I, it, because the adults by and large had opted to do what they did. Mm -hmm. You know, whether or not, you know, others were in agreement with it, they had a choice, but the children had no choice. And uh, so that that really uh, was what hooked me very much into this story, these stories, because there are many. Hmm. Really, really interesting. Um, Tessa, thank you for, for joining us and for, for writing your book. And um, we'll put it up on screen so if people see it when we go uh, live. Uh, Tessa Bridal is the author of The Dark Side of Memory, Uruguay's Disappeared Children and the Families That Never Stopped searching. We really appreciate you joining us. This was a um, really thoughtful and, and fascinating conversation. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. I have to admit, um, Brad, our producer, we were talking at the start of the show about ailments because that's what you do when you're like over 35. You just start talking about your ailments all day long. And it's really fascinating. <laughs> It's like, oh, you've had that too? Oh, what helped you with that ailment? And I think that's just the rest of our lives. That's just what happens after 35. It's just talking about your ailments all day long and your sleep patterns. Uh, but part of that is he's like, oh, you're wearing a nice little uh, camouflage sweatshirt today. And I said, yeah, there was no way in hell I was going to put on anything that made me uncomfortable because I had a rough night sleeping because of my sciatica. Um, and that is partly because I'm out of my tincture. What tincture do you ask? Oh, it's the Sunset Lake CBD tincture that helps me sleep through the night. Very important. Very, very, very important. Sunset Lake CBD, I talk about it all the time. I use it and it actually makes a difference in my life. It makes a difference in my productivity, the time I wake up in the morning, how deep my sleep is, what kind of pain I have. Am I cranky? Am I not cranky? You know, all these things matter. And it really matters when you're around me too. Sunset Lake CBD is a farmer owned company that ships craft CBD directly from their farm in Vermont to your door. They have all types of products, not just tinctures. They have salves and gummies and coffee and lotions, and it's all designed to help with stress, aches, and pains. Their farm was actually a Ben & Jerry's farm in Vermont, and they diversified it by growing premium hemp. Premium hemp. That makes a difference because... I don't know if you've had any of that uh, bodega CBD that I've had. It's a waste of money and it's not premium hemp and it don't work. This stuff works. I didn't, I didn't know until I tried it and I am hooked, totally hooked. My whole family's hooked. My mom's hooked. My aunt's hooked. You know, friends of mine are hooked. Seriously, we have like a whole, I, you know, it's, it's, they could basically call, a, you know, start a multi-level marketing firm if they wanted, because I have so many friends and family that are now using Sunset Lake CBD because it's made a difference in their lives. Uh, but, you know, they're also good people because not only do they create a great product, but they're, they're, they're contributing to sustaining rural economies. They are enhancing the community by building up that economy and creating meaningful employment. Their minimum wage is $15 an hour. Their employees own the majority of their company. And on top of all that, they support independent media like the David Pakman Show, the Majority Report, and the Nomi Key Show. Go check out Sunset Lake CBD at sunsetlakecbd.com. You can get 20% off of your entire order by typing in Nomi, N-O-M-I. And they've got new products. They've got dog biscuits. They have a new tincture, which just in time for me to try it, that has 1,200 milligrams of CBD oil infused with 90 milligrams of melatonin, which will help you go to sleep. So the melatonin gets you to sleep and the CBD oil helps you stay asleep. Go check it out at sunsetlakecbd.com and you will type in Nomi and get 20% off of your entire product, everything that you buy, all at sunsetlakecbd.com. We'll be right back with our amazing panel. Welcome back. It's Fem Friday. Welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. Did I mention it's Fem Friday? <laughs> if you haven't told your friends that Fem Friday exists, please do because nobody else does this. I don't know if you know that. I don't know if you know that most of YouTube politics uh, is hosted by men. It's okay because most of our audience is male, uh, as is most of the audience on YouTube politics. With that being said, we it is our 
mission. We want to make sure that there are more women, um, all types of women on this channel. We're having conversations about issues related to women that maybe don't necessarily uh, dominate this space, but also issues that don't really, you know, they're not female centered issues. Uh, so this is what is to me, I think it's very special. I'm really excited that we do this and turns out people really like it. And, you know, it, it tends to be one of our better shows of the week. So, uh, if you have the opportunity and the willingness to do, to do so, make sure to like and subscribe and share this with your friends and tell people about Fun Friday, help educate more and more folks about why we do this show and why we need to have more female voices in the YouTube political space on air, uh, in the chats, sharing, getting involved in the conversations, because when you have a political space on a platform that is extremely powerful, whether it's YouTube or Twitch uh, or Facebook, of course, but specifically YouTube and Twitch, I can tell you for sure, and you're only seeing male voices, you're not hearing the full picture. You're not, there, there are perspectives that are being left out. There are takes on political issues. There are political issues being left out. And then of course, um, you know, representation matters. So you're likely to have more of a female audience when you have more female hosts. And that of course is good for democracy. With us today, I'm very excited. Uh, we have Rose Adams. She is a freelance reporter and the former political, a political fellow at The Intercept. She was also over at the Brooklyn Paper and AM New York covering New York City politics. You know, I love to talk about that. And we have Janelle Jolly on who is also, she's covered uh, New York politics. She's talked about it on our show before, but now she's in California and she's the host of What's Left to Do. Hello, hello. Welcome. Hey, how's it going? This is a fun panel. I'm excited. Uh, this is why I love Fridays. It's just, you know, chill and and off camera we talked about uh dogs for about 25 minutes maybe yeah. we'll share that at the end of the show so so people can get a piece of that um all right listen i i, I you know there have been so many takes on what's happening with the, the the two people who are set to just like contribute to the end of the republic and possibly uh civilization if we don't get <laughs> our our handle on climate change of course, I'm talking about Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema, but let's just uh, update folks on the saga of Manchinema. Um, starting with Joe Manchin, the OG, <laughs> the OG uh, obstructionist. Let's play this clip of, of what's happening with him in the Democratic Party. Well, the president has his, his, his priorities, okay, I'm, and, and he knows I have my priorities, and, and, and um, he's my president, and I, I want him to succeed, and I want our country to succeed. And that means we all have to communicate and be honest with each other. And I think that's uh, that's a dialogue we have. It's Joe Manchin's world. The rest of us are just grateful we're allowed to live in it. The president's economic agenda hinges largely on support from the senator from West Virginia. On his thinking right now, Hans Nichols of Axios reports it this way, quote, Manchin is telling colleagues that progressives need to pick just one of President Biden's three signature policies for helping working families and discard the other two by forcing progressives to choose among an expanded child tax credit, paid family medical leave, or subsidies for child care, Manchin is complicating any potential deal, but also signaling his willingness to negotiate. Back with us tonight, two friends. Okay. I, oof. Back with us on the oh. show. He, I mean, that to me, it's just because this is Fun Friday. I, I know Kirsten cinema has got her own thing, but like, this is just like such male energy. Like you just walk into a room and you're like, you answer to me. I represent a state that is literally one thirtieth the size of the city of Los Angeles. And yet I want to. All right, Janelle, you just because uh, you're. Got so here's what's here's what's enraging to me about about this entire spectacle over reconciliation. The, the negotiations, if we can call them as such, it's more like, you know, a hostage situation. They are presented to the public as if Joe Manchin and, and Kristen Cinema like, cannot be leaned on. And in a way that, obviously, they wouldn't be able to, like, report out. But, but it's presented as if, like, we have to take these two individuals so seriously. We have to, uh, we have to, we have to set up the pretext for, to negotiate w with ourselves, within the party, on what is ostensibly the president's agenda. It's maddening. Um, because when he, in that clip where uh, Joe Manchin was saying, you know, the, the president has his priorities and I've got mine, his priorities 
are for his own personal enrichment. Let's be very clear. There's nothing keeping Joe Biden from, I don't know, maybe putting the screws to Joe Manchin's daughter who was caught red-handed price fixing uh, the EpiPen. Uh, so all of a sudden that could create problems for her and her country. Vote for my mm. shit. Am I allowed to curse? Yeah, no, he's fine. Great, great. super. It's uh, fine. His, I, remember, his, I remember when um, Jesse on Full House said shit in uh, like 1994, and I was like, "What?" If he, it <laughs> sticks in my mind. Like, if they could get away with that, then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's also his Joe Manchin's interests largely are centered on energy uh, and and you know dirty energy vis-a-vis -vis coal. So. What's keeping what's keeping Joe Biden from, I don't know, maybe the EPA designating, you know, some under for national security reasons like nuclear waste at all the coal sites that he has interest in. Like there are ways to lean on this guy. So let's not act like he's a good faith actor. And what type of message are you sending to people in 2022 where where, you know, you you are willing to negotiate with someone who wants you to pick one of three social safety net programs that would vast that would be that are hugely popular across the country going into a really tough election year. Like, give me a break. I'm so tired of Democrats mm -hmm. negotiating with themselves. But that's kind of how they set up the party. You know, the DSCC, you know, they they created these monsters and, you know, the blue dogs or, you know, centrist Democrats precisely for this reason. But you can only you can only, you know, caterwaul or wave your hands like, oh, I don't know. I don't know how we're going to do this for so long before people yeah. really like check out because people aren't stupid like this looks dumb like people 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 get that like they get it now this, yeah. isn't, this isn't passing the sniff test lean on these people this is your agenda you're the head of the party you have multiple levers in order to coerce you know carrot stick choose i don't i don't care but do it now because if you want this to be successful such that it actually reaches people and people uh, are able to um, understand uh, the benefit of these programs such that they want to continue voting you in office in 2022, 2024. This needs to get done now because these things take time to like trickle down and actually, you know, get to people. So like spare me, but like, don't, don't, don't give me, you know, the Senate, like we've, we've got to negotiate with the Senate. No, the fuck you don't. Sorry. I, I, I love that you were like, listen, there's two, two, two uh, major corruption scandals yes. that could be investigated that in, in a, in, in a swipe of a pen or a phone call right. uh, in a very legal way, Joe Biden could call up the AG and be like, Hey, very curious. What are you up to? Are you doing anything? I mean, there's you, busy? So, you busy? Yeah. You, you got a job to do. We, it looks like there's this major, major story involving right. ep EpiPen. Yes, of course. Right. Um, so, Rose, okay. you cover New York city politics and I, you know, I've heard people make this take over and over, and I was like, ah, it's not necessarily the same. But this is this the IDC. The IDC were eight Democrats who were caucusing with Republicans from Democratic districts for the most part, who were literally caucusing with Republicans for perks, for little things. I mean, it was more, it, it was smaller scale in terms of like what these senators like were, were holding up all of, of progress for in New York. It was like a bigger office or some, you know, campaign contributions or whatever. But it was a power play. And, and Jeff Klein, to me, who is the leader of the IDC, reminds me of Joe Manchin in that he would always be like, it's on my terms. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? So, I mean, Rose, is, is, is this just sort of one of those like governor government has these flaws and there are loopholes and, and, and capital is going to find a way to exploit those loopholes and and hold up whatever, um, even in times of crises. Yeah, I feel like there's a lot of parallels that just like they operate in a similar way where I feel like there's that one aspect of capital being the other side here. And by playing like, oh, both sides are reasonable. They both have an actual ideology behind them or there's a real reason to push back against these progressive, you know, lefty sort of ideals. That's like the, the thought that there are two actual sides with ideologies that are making them do what they do is just disingenuous. I mean, it's like there's actual lobbying and there's like corporate corporate interests on one side that is like the ideology that is holding people back. And then there's actual ideology and change and ideas and like policy on the other side. And so I think there's like just having the both sides is um, be part of the framing of the issue of like, okay, well, they, they must have a real reason that they are not for these policies. But 
And that's, that was what was so revealing about when Kirsten Cinema just refuses to actually say in public what it is about the policies that she has a problem with, because it clarifies that, no, it's not actually two sides here that are have, it's not a war of ideas. It's a war of idea and plan versus I'm going to, you know, try to be an obstructionist because I want to seem like I'm a both sides person. And because I have a capital, you know, sort of interest in, in that. You know, you think with all this money that they'd have better talking points too. I mean, she's just like, she has nothing. Um, yeah. I want to play this clip of Pramila Jayapal. Congresswoman Jayapal is the leader of the Progressive Caucus. Uh, she was on CNN being asked about Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema not moving on their negotiations for this infrastructure bill. Let's, let's roll that clip. And reports that President Biden told lawmakers that he has spent many hours with Senators Manchin and Sinema and said, quote, they don't move. So if they won't move or they don't move for him, the president, what's supposed to happen? Well, Don, I, you know, in my conversations with the White House, I hear that Senators Manchin and Cinema are sitting down, are negotiating, are talking about what they are for, not just what they're against. And we have to believe that they are going to move, that the president is going to be able to move them. Because remember, Don, this is the president's agenda. This is the agenda that Democrats in the House, the Senate, and the, and the White House, the president, ran on. And it's why voters came out in states including Arizona and Georgia and across the country, because Democrats said, we are not going to leave people behind. We are going to help working class people across this country, poor people across this country, black, brown, indigenous people across this country to be able to have a shot. That's what the Build Back Better Act is. It's child care, um, where no family has to pay more than 7% uh, in, in their income for child care. It's paid leave, 12 weeks of paid family leave done. We'd finally be catching up to other countries. It's taking on the climate crisis with real action. It's making sure that we're investing in housing across our country, which is so essential. And, of course, expanding Medicare and giving benefits to seniors and making sure that health care is available in the middle of a crisis and lifting up immigrants. I mean, that's all in the Build Back Better agenda. And the idea that two people might not want to do all of that and might be blocking what we promised is obviously um, you know, it's a problem, but I don't believe that's going to happen. I do believe the negotiations are moving forward. I think we're going to get it done. OK, so then what needs to be done to meet that one point nine to two point two trillion dollar uh, budget the president has floated? Is that number something that you are even willing to consider? Well, as I said to the president just a couple of days ago, um, I am really hoping that it can stay much closer to three trillion. Just remember, Don. OK, um, that, that was an important point right at the end. So, you know, what I want to get to, and obviously she talked a lot about what was in the bill and that was more of a case for the American people. Right. But um, what I really want to get to is what's happening through the negotiations. Right. So she is she wants to keep the number high. She seems to think that they're going to come around. Um what do you, I mean, I guess the first question is, all right, if they do come around, what do you think is going to be taken off this bill? What do you think this is really coming down to? Go for it, Janelle. So I think, which I, I, I'm a little nervous about, but I think that, um, it, 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 let's place the number, the top line number aside for a second. Uh, what I think that as a last dish effort, and he's already kind of signaled this, that Joe Manchin might be using to, um, to uh, as his kind of trump card in negotiations, is uh, including the Hyde Amendment and the reconciliation right. bill, which that would cause extreme calamity. And Pramila, and, you know, you can see it, it just, you know, it says it all on her face. She's so over all this because it's so stupid. Uh, but uh, Pramila said that it's dead on arrival if Hyde is in there. Like, progressives are saying, like, that is their red line in the sand. We're not, you know, fuck the number. I'm not, you know, we're not going to ban federal funds for abortion. Like, and, and he doesn't really care about that, though. No, he of course he doesn't knows. care. That's he's a Catholic and, you know, yeah. whatever. Um, but he, but he's, but he's, you know, he's, he's, he's inserted that as, as a, like one of his chips or whatever during, during this negotiation. Personally, I think that maybe where they end up, even though I think that, I think I would like to see progressives in the House 
hold strong. That top line that matters. Um, so I personally, I think that they should, they should, they should have stuck there and not let any, um, uh, not let that get negotiated down any, but if they want to get creative with the math, I think maybe making the duration of these programs shorter in order to like fit everything they want in this. But I just want to say one thing. I think that I don't know that anyone is looking forward in terms of how, if this negotiation um, gets watered down uh, within the Democratic Party, how that hurts Democrats, not just just on a basic like retail political level, but in 2024, if you know the other guy comes back to run again, he could credibly he could credibly say, "I'm a, you know I did more for the American people during this crisis. I was able to pass a six trillion dollar bill, and I got you know Democrats to vote for my plan." They, they couldn't even get two members of their own party to pass something, you know, half the price of everything that I passed because you know there were two rescue bills under under the former president, and like, and he wouldn't be lying. He, he did more in terms of like getting more money out of the door and, you know, lowering poverty, pausing student loan. And we don't know where that what, what that's going to come amount to in 2022. So honestly, be as aggressive as you can, because because the opposition who, my opinion, is laying in wait, absolutely would have a credible claim to make you look like the party who can't who's ineffective intrapartal intrapartily that's not a word but in, in an, on an intraparty basis and who and, and at that point what what choice would a lot of americans on the margins make it's like well yeah you're right you're right, right. it's, so, it's your fundamental means i mean that's it's it that's what it always comes down to is right. you know what what <laughs> are you addressing people's you know day-to-day right concerns? and where were joe manchin and Kristen cinema on the six trillion dollar bill in, in march of 2020 give me a break get out of here rose what do you think Uh, I agree. I guess I would. It's tough because I would not want anything to be made into something that's too short term just because, I mean, the point you'd think is to have this propel the Democrats in future elections and uh, by watering anything down so that you're taking away the long term aspect and the long term effect because people people forget so quickly. You know, if you do something nice for someone as a politician in one year, three years later, no one's going to be voting for you. I mean, a very small portion of the population is going to be voting for you because of that thing. They don't remember things. It's a very myopic sort of system. And so I think that that's, that's sort of a, a risk I see is, as, is cutting things too short. I mean, it's good that this is an eight year long bill. It's like, it's going to keep the momentum going. People are going to see the benefits of it now and later. So I guess that's, that's something that I think is important in regards to like how to move forward. That's, that's interesting. Cause you know, I've been thinking like everyone says, okay, well, well, Kirsten Sinema is going to be primaried and who cares if she's primary? She wouldn't make a general election right now. She barely won her general election. Also that's several years from now. That's like, you know, having that, I understand it's public's a great way for organizers to start raising the money to actually build that community. That's all wonderful, but that's not the end all be all. That's not what's going to move her in this moment. And I think that we're all kind of struggling with what is going to move her at this moment. And I think at the end of the day, what, what we're all saying here is it might be internal stuff. It might be the, 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 the how the sausage is made kind of politics that happens behind closed doors. I just want to see one, like, after, especially that mansion clip. I would love for one female senator to just get up and just casually, you know, when, when asked by the press just how frustrated she is that he gets to just literally walk around and dictate everything. And then on top of it, throws in the Hyde Amendment, which shows how little he respects women. Forget about whether or not he believes in the Hyde Amendment or not, or if it's actually something, you know, it's a distraction and it's at the expense of women. And that's, right. that's how casually he thinks as a Democrat from West Virginia about women and their bodies. So we can never have conversations about, about more holistic issues related to reproductive health because we're too busy fighting over the stuff that we solved 30 years ago. That's right. And he is enabling that. That's right. He is enabling that. All right, let's, let's just... Um, Speaking of enablers, uh, Fox News had some coverage of the activists that have been protesting. I just, this is, this is, this is. Bernie Sanders refusing to sign a joint statement condemning this week's harassment of fellow Senator Kirsten Sinema. (laughs) 
unless it included language pressuring her to change her stance on that welfare bill of his, of theirs. This is according to a report from Axios. Here now, Matt Schlapp, American Conservative Union chairman. Matt, I just first want to point out, this is the guy who had a supporter who tried to murder Republicans and almost did murder Steve Scalise, and he's not going to sign a blanket statement condemning harassment unless it includes this caveat. So he's essentially saying, I'll say it's unacceptable only if we put in there why she kind of deserved it. Yeah, so these are not spontaneous protests. Obviously, when you get people who are here in the country illegally to act as lobbyists uh, for this big budget-busting bill, um, this is an orchestrated thing. And what you realize is that the Democrats, along with these left-wing nonprofits on the outside, uh, they coordinate very closely. And clearly, Bernie Sanders was very comfortable with that pressure in the bathroom and on the airplane and in elevators and other places put on Kristen Cinema and Joe Manchin at his vacation property and everything else. This, these are the tactics of the Democratic Party endorsed by Bernie Sanders. Matt, either condemn it or don't condemn it, as it should be. It's right. harassment, but it is like saying rape is wrong, but maybe you shouldn't wear that short skirt and those high heels. I said it, you didn't, look, but Joe, that's what it that's what it sounds like. I can't even. Yeah, and Joe Biden didn't uh, do anything much different. He said, hey, this is part of the process. Uh, you know, maybe it shouldn't be part of the process. And maybe we should have a president that says, look, there are disagreements we have on politics, but you shouldn't disrupt someone's family. You shouldn't follow someone to the bathroom. You shouldn't harass somebody when they're on vacation. I mean, there should be a water's edge in politics. I'm a hard charging person in politics. I have my views. Uh, I don't think I should go to someone's house and try to get in the back door or follow them into the bathroom. I think it's creepy. And I think the American people are going to reject this form of uh, kind of socialist tactics that the <laughs> Democratic. Oh, OK. So much here. Right. I just oh, want to start off with this is I wanted to play the whole thing because this to me was just the perfect Fox propaganda segment from yeah. from from budget busting language to you know, this is, these are socialist tactics to the nonprofits. I mean, the only thing he didn't throw in there was Soros. I was really surprised there was no Soros yeah, in right. there. Right. To rape, to, oh my God, it was, this was, if you're going to create some propaganda, blah, that yes. is it. That is it. Okay, but but for real, um, them being the spokespeople of Democrat Senator uh, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema says enough for me. Like, I, it, yeah. Um, Janelle, okay. Obviously, it, there's a lot of hypocrisy here. Like they don't care about James O'Keefe. They don't care about January sixth. Uh, January sixth. Are you are you are you serious? You're getting precious about following her into the bathroom and and where were you guys on like how you covered January sixth? Give me a break. I mean, and, I can't believe. It. Oh, go ahead. And, and and then they mentioned Steve Scalise being shot by. A Bernie Sanders, whatever the hell it was. Like it was I don't, right. somehow Bernie I don't even Sanders know what that's in a reference to. I don't either. And I didn't even know he had voted for, oh, who knows. But right. hi, um, Charlottesville? Really curious. Hello. Right. Uh, <laughs> Michigan, you know, you know the, the band of, you know, loonies who was about who was trying to like take the governor out like well, like this is a this, you guys are this is a you're a little bit out of your depth and i can't believe that i'm agreeing with joe biden here but yeah that is a part of the process when you are a senator who almost exclusively avails herself to you know big uh big money donors uh and lobbyists uh that she you know shake down in order to you know create create some faux opposition how else are your constituents are people supposed to get through to you because clearly it's not where clearly the regular channels aren't working so yeah things get a little bit of con confrontation things get a little confrontational but that's politics baby and that's the game that we're in um and that's the least that should have happened to her for the you know with her you know like non-specific kind of inchoate opposition uh that would directly particularly the bit about medicare uh, expanding those benefits that would directly help so many people in her state like give me a break i don't i that the people need to continue i don't my my preferred term is not harassment but like constituent confrontation i would like to see more of that uh with her and any of our elected officials if you're not doing the people's work the people deserve to be up in your business and you won't get any rest until you deliver and 
in in the way that we sent you to Congress to do. Please get out of here. And and and, and you know they're in public spaces. The the Correct. Public, the, the activists are. No one was um, climbing in her window. You're yeah, you're in a public sense. building. I'll follow you in there. Like they made it sound like she they broke into her right. like, house and like went into her bathroom. That's it's just completely misrepresenting what happened. Correct. Oh, but they were. But don't forget they're illegals too. I mean that was that was the other part that I I. Well, was, yeah. Wow. It's like right. it's like okay. Here's a pot of words. Just throw them all in. Let's That's get right. everything out in this. Right. Sentence. Make an outrage soup with all of the words that should trigger our viewers. Yeah. Yeah, and then just throwing in like. And bothering Manchin in his vacation home, like that, they can't make it sound worse than that. Right, exactly. <laughs> on his yacht. On his yacht. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! Also, what are you doing on vacation? We're in the middle of an economic crisis, like, Hello? and you're a senator in charge. You're holding up government. It's That's right. people have a right to take vacations, absolutely. But if you're in the Senate in the middle of this major crisis in which you are personally yes. holding up. Like yeah. Literally, yeah. not the other senator, not the other senator, you. Yeah. And the wino, the wino doing her, and I am a wino, but I would, if I, I don't know, had um, the personal ability to, to make sure that literally millions, hundreds of millions of people right. had the ability to like support themselves through this right. economic crisis, I probably wouldn't go do an, a wine internship in Napa Valley. I also wouldn't go to Napa Valley. That's right. just, you know, oh, California wine is totally <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Um, let's switch gears just a little bit. I mean that I, I, I want to save that segment because I just feel like we as messengers should be studying that because it was, it was, it was very Fox. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Roger Ailes is clapping from his grave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, in the meantime, partly because our, our government is completely unresponsive and, and because of people like Matt Schlapp and, and conservatives who, you know, who Dagan McDowell on the, the financial side of, of Fox have been uh, declaring a war and, and waging a war against unions for the last three or four decades. Uh, because of that, we are seeing labor all over the country, people who are still part of unions, where unions still hold strong, or those who do not have unions, you're seeing folks organize. Uh, let's uh, let's put that, that article up on screen. In The Guardian, uh, they've reported that there's a wave of U.S. labor unrest that could see tens of thousands on strike within weeks. Everything from healthcare to Hollywood, which we'll get to, they're all fighting for higher wages. Uh, fighting cuts and seeking better and safer conditions. Because of course, during this pandemic, as we know from, from, from the Kellogg strike or the Nabisco strike, or even, you know, back at Amazon, Amazon in particular, I mean, folks have been working the grind. In Instacart. Instacart, exactly. I mean, this is yeah. how labor is being treated right now in 2021 is not very far off from from what was happening in you know the Triangle Shirt Factory, for instance, okay. um, and that was a key moment. I mean, the Triangle Triangle Shirt Factory fires literally um, launched so much of the progressive movement from that era, uh, and also reporting too, investigative reporting that came out of that. Um, so, Janelle, I mean, what's how do you feel about this? Do you think that it's enough? You know what? I'm. I mean, I'm obviously in support of uh, all shows, minus the cops, of uh, labor power. Um, and when I when I kind of reflect on how we got to this particular um, uh, strike wave, I go back to um, last spring, early summer, like when at the height of the pandemic and the confusion. The best. The best thing for the workers that could have happened was uh, this term, you know, essential workers uh, uh, getting inserted into the zeitgeist Mm -hmm. that I that I think was did a big um, did a lot in terms of developing this this labor consciousness, because what we what we would come to understand essential workers to mean is like. We, we are the ones that keep this country running. We are also the ones that disproportionately are, are, uh, suffer labor abuses um, and we are treated disproportionately worse than our, you know, our, white, our other, other workers who don't have to endure what we have to do. So that was like the best thing that could have happened for the workers and probably the worst thing that could have happened for the bosses, this, this popularizing of this term. Um, but I think because COVID in a, in a weird way, it was such a revolutionary force that hit every single sector of society. 
it was it was a blessing and a curse for workers um, in terms of getting us to this point of uh, social class consciousness and how to and how to um, exercise uh, some labor power. Um, so I, I would we have gotten here absent COVID probably eventually, but I think COVID hastened it because uh, the contradictions were so stark. We you this country cannot operate without us. Yet we are being paid poverty wages. We aren't given, you know, the time off that we, any time off in some cases, uh, you know, our health care benefits either are absent or, or paltry. Um, so, you know what? I'm, I'm, I understand how essential I am, how necessary I am. I understand how essential and necessary my coworkers are. See what you can do without us. And, and, and simultaneously, there are many in these, these fields have been asked to do more. That's so right. It was That's bad right. already. As profits have risen, and yes. I think that it's, I think that there was no there's no way to to not sit up and take notice and fight back against that. Particularly, you know, for people. Particularly, wasn't it the? Um, I don't think I'm thinking of another snack maker. Maybe it was um, people who make Doritos, Lay's, Frito yes. Lay's. Yeah. Yeah. Those workers. I remember some of the stories coming out of uh, the workers who were striking there. Where you know during during the pandemic, you know, profits were rising or you know exploding because you know everyone's at home, like stress eating, whatever. But you know they were working twelve hour twelve hour days, seven days a week. Um, you know at the beginning not, you know, given the PPE. So lots of people were getting sick and, and, you know, couldn't, couldn't afford, you know, to, to be seen, but how, how else, what else, it was inevitable that we would get here due to those conditions. And I think that this is, I think that this is a really important moment that we're in for labor that hopefully will be a, we can maintain some solidarity for the workers who are currently on strike, but this can also be instructive uh, going forward uh, for future uh, labor actions, particularly in the gig economy, because we, you know, they are, I would argue they are the most abused um, and maligned in terms of um, uh, labor participants. Um, but I think that this is a moment to seize and build. Uh, and I'm really excited by it. I'm energized by it. And unfortunately, it was, I was thinking to myself the other day, Unfor it's so unfortunate, you know, I've never used like Instacart or da -da -da, and I don't even really eat snack food. So I'm like, ah! I feel like I can't stick it to them because I never, <laughs> <laughs> never use them anyway. <laughs> Maybe I'll develop like a chip habit and just to be able to say, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not <doing> <laughs> This is all happening simultaneously as as the PRO Act is mm -hmm. a, a big part of the president's agenda as well, which, oh my God, thank mm -hmm. God. But um, if the PRO Act is passed, which, you know, who knows right now what's going what's gonna to happen, um, if it does, it doesn't, and, and what comes out, what kind of legislative changes might happen out of, out of this um, disaster that we're in right now. But if it is passed, let's just say that. And you have this level of protests happening um, and strikes happening, excuse me. Uh, in, in so many different industries, frontline or not. Is this the return of unions? Because this is, you know, these strikes are happening with extremely weakened unions. And, you know, it's why some of these strikes won't really, you know, be as successful, at least immediately, as many hope. Because we, labor is so weak and big business is so deregulated in this country. But if the PRO Act passes, will we see something pretty quickly um, turning around and making it easier for, for folks to strike? I think so. I mean, I think that there's, there's like an upside, as Janelle was saying, to all of this happening now during COVID and that like the status quo was disrupted. And I think that's really important to happen in terms of progressive change. Like in the past, you know, we got social security and some of the biggest welfare progressive policies in, from FDR's time during that huge you know, economic downturn, think people were in crisis, people couldn't live according to the status quo anymore. And it became obvious that things had to change quickly. And so, the, you know, it sort of was a galvanizing force. And so I think, you know, obviously, COVID is a very different kind of uh, destabilizing force. But I think it, it could have some of the similar effects where people are suddenly re realizing and not that they didn't know before, but it's really clarifying, like heightening the contrast between like how they're living their life and like what the conditions they are going through are and what they're getting from it and how it's really putting them like on the front lines and by just being paid $15 an hour to, you know, work at a supermarket that's for during the, you know, peak of COVID is really putting you on the front line. And I think that really like, that's, that's a lot, that does a lot for, you know, labor consciousness. It, it sort of, makes people aware of, of the conditions they're in, I think, that they haven't realized before. But in terms of the PRO Act, I do think it could be um, 
yeah, I, I, this all this happening at once is, you know, it, it does seem to be something that could help the PRO Act's passing. Um, and yeah, I mean, since it's all about unions, you'd think that it would sort of, uh, it would definitely kind of, I think, help people protest, give them sort of a template and open up the floodgates a little bit. So I, I could see that definitely happening. And, you know, not to mention the fact that there is this labor "Quote unquote labor, labor shortage," which uh, folks have have not failed to say, is it really a labor shortage, or are you just just people are like, it's not Where's worth me dying, yeah. <laughs> not, not me dying for you to pay me pennies, and you don't even give me PPE. You That's know, maybe that has something to do with it. Um, <laughs> all right, uh, last before before we wrap up, I I saw this story and I was like, of course, of course. There's a special report out. Uh, put this on screen that. OAN, I don't know if you know about the One America News Network. It is a, an extremely pro-Trump network. It was on the fringes. I mean, I, I'm, I got an invitation to go on Newsmax today, for instance. So these are, these are channels that sometimes leftists do get invited on. But I would always be like, these are like, it's like a fringe channel until Trump obviously grew and Trump challenged Fox and Trump moved people over to OAN and Newsmax. Uh, well, it turns out, they're not really that fringy because AT&T, wow. the world's largest communications company, is one is is their major investor. Hmm. This is not a nonpartisan news network or bipartisan. They're not fair and balanced. They didn't even try to be fair and balanced. They're not an entertainment channel as as Fox News likes to label themselves. They are a fringe far right conspiracy theory front fronts and center conspiracy theory channel and AT&T this comes out the week that Facebook comes under fire because uh, obviously as a monopoly it was really fun when they when they uh, had some some tech issues and, and we, everybody was locked out which affects you know not only their bottom line but many people have built their businesses and and communicate with folks especially in other countries um, and in different communities and, and the states around messenger and, and these other platforms as the hearings came out that there have been internal investigations at Facebook about the bias, about their, uh, their con- how they contribute to the extremism um, in this country, the partisanship and the hate, and of course the, the, the January 6th attacks. And Facebook literally did nothing. Um, this comes out when the Pandora Papers have come out, showing that uh, the rich and wealthy, and, and some of them are really, really not pleasant people have been hiding their money in different places. And some are more surprising like Shakira, which, you know, depresses me. So this all comes out that AT&T, this is all public information. This was no secret. I want to go to Rose first because she, she, she focuses on finances and she reports on these things. This is out there front and center. And yet no one seemed to care until now this week when all of this stuff, this perfect storm happened. Is this, the norm? Are we are we missing something? Are we not understanding how far right these big companies are and what they're pushing on us? Yeah, it almost it does suggest that it's kind of a norm, and especially when uh, it, it, especially when it's something very unique, like uh, you know OAN, where it's just it, it's very far right leaning. It's not bound by journalistic standards, so it can just promote AT and T because that was part of the issue, right? That they were that they were. were because they were really promoting at and It wasn't just ads. It was like some promotion as well. And so they're not really bound by journalistic standards, but they still have a pretty big viewership. And so they can just do that kind of thing for corporations. And it's like a win-win for them, um, which is, yeah, it's it's just crazy. There's like no rules about it. It's just can It just can happen in the open. And uh, all you can do is like wag your finger. Well, and I think what's jarring to me is these are companies that even I was like, all right, they're not that far right. They're not like January 6th companies. Mm -hmm. These are companies that, you know, are capitalists and definitely invest in Republicans and in Democrats. And sometimes Republicans get a little wacky and and then they have to course correct and, you know, support Joe Biden because we've gone too far right again. Um, But no, no, they are literally pushing us into the abyss. They are investing in the extremism of this. I mean, you know, maybe they're not, they're, they're not overtly racist, but they're just, you know, it, it just happens to be that communities on the margins and uh, communities that, I mean, that they're, they're contributing to the racism of this country. No, no, they are helping design it. 
this is, I feel like we need to have congressional hearings about this. This is such an, I don't know, Janelle. So I, I think I have a little bit different. I agree with you, but what I think the, the way I, um, the way I'm analyzing this is like, this is the insidious nature of capitalism. If I'm going to put on my business hat uh, and, you know, pretend to be, you know, put my monocle in and, you know, I'm a rapacious capitalist. This is, <laughs> this represents a, a, uh, a growth opportunity that is not available really in the media landscape anymore of like resegmenting the, the, the Fox news, um, broadly speaking, the Fox News audience uh, for a for a, another kind of right wing leaning conservative uh, project. And I think that their calculation had nothing has nothing to do with ideology. It's just that they are so because of the duopoly of Facebook and Google, there are very few um, other opportunities for a media organization mm. um, to attract ad money. And I'm not saying that that makes it right. Absolutely not. But I think that's the nature of capitalism. You're always looking for a way to generate returns, generate profits um, and maximize them, you know, when there's an available window. Uh, that being said, um, I, I I don't think that there's going to be a congressional hearing about that because that's these that's just that's business. But I think that it's important to 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 include just like like that is that is why it is necessary to develop and my opinion, an anti-capitalist kind of um, critique and framework because things like this will continue to happen uh, because that's, that, that is the nature, that is their want, that is what they exist to do. Um, do I think it's deplor deplorable? Absolutely. Will I, will I be watching? Absolutely. I mean, I don't watch any broadcast news, but I certainly will be watching them. But, but for them, it, I think it came down to brass tax dollars and cents. This is, there are not so many opportunities anymore um, to, to spin up a media organization. There is a energized, um, uh, focused, or at least interested um, audience to to you know ripped off of and you know sell chashkis and whatever else. Um, you take the opportunity and you run with it, even if it it is there's no net benefit to society. But that's capitalism. It doesn't. There doesn't have to be. There's just there's a market. And I'm going. I want to play in it. Well, this is the danger of of monopolies in particular. Is, Absolutely. Is, you know, there's, we can't avoid that we're on Twitch, which is owned by Amazon. We can't avoid that, you know, right. Google is, 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 oh, is one of our platforms. Exactly. And, yep. and, yep. you know, it is what it is. And there's limited opportunities for people to That's get right. their voices out, especially if you're on the left and, and independent. Right. But th there's a difference between independent media and. Oh, absolutely. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, all right. Rose, Janelle. It's been so fun. This went by so fast. So fast. I really appreciate you. Thanks this for joining us for Fun Friday. Come back soon. Yeah. Love it. Love the conversation. All right. Um, to our, our guests, thank you for joining us. And to everybody who's tuned in for Fun Friday, as I said earlier in the show, make sure to share it with your friends. Let people know that we're doing something special over here. Literally, nobody else does this. <laughs> it's kind of a big deal. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. There aren't many female hosts. Janelle is one. And there are many female for reporters, believe it or not. I saw the statistics recently and I was like, I did not realize how bad it was. So, you know, support your, your reporters and your hosts. And of course, um, the more we have representation that's diverse on these platforms, the more we're going to get people who engage with them uh, more reflective of the society that we live in. Because this is where the conversations are being driven. And what does that mean when so many people are being left out of the conversations? So very important to join us on Fun Fridays. Thanks, Rose. Thanks, Janelle. Thank you. Thank you. To everybody else, we are so appreciative of you. If you are not already a patron of ours, please join us on patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show. Check us out on Rockfin. On Tuesdays, we do TNS Live. And on TNS Live, we have a, an exclusive conversation uh, you know, with a guest. We had uh, Stephen Donziger on on our first show. We had Tom Hartman on this week. We have these exclusive conversations with them. They only appear on Rockfin. They are live. No edits. And you can share questions with us too, and we will bring them up on that show, on that live show. Rockfin.com uh, slash Nomi Key, N-O-M-I-K-I. That's on Tuesday night at 8 p.m. And of course, we're back here on Wednesdays and Fridays. But join us on Patreon. That is how we make everything, you know, grow. And, and you have to support female in media. I'm, I'm telling you, I've, I know what some of these numbers are comparing women to men who are hosts. And some 
I love my male colleagues, uh, but some of them have, you know, don't have the breadth of experience of many of the female hosts that are out there who've been, you know, my case, have been working in politics for over two decades and have done a lot of media work. And I know other friends of mine who are female hosts do as well and have a ton of experience. Uh, And yet they're fighting for a 10th, a 20th of the subscribers or, or support that folks who are, you know, men (laughs) just decide to do a podcast because they're in DSA. I'm really surprised by some of the numbers. Maybe we'll have some folks on to talk about it and share um, if they're open to do it. But I think that we really have to understand these systemic issues. So if you can, please help spread that message and support women in media. All right. We will see you next week. Stay in solidarity. Oh, we'll see you from Scotland. I'm going to be there covering the climate. Uh, It's going to be climate week. So we're going to be talking about climate all week. So make sure to check us out uh, right here. Click like and subscribe and we will see you next week. Stay in solidarity. The No Mickey Show. Clash momentarily for class solidarity. Cash circulate and give the masses back its currency. Greed from elites, oligarchs stay fed. Deep state, faith fed. Everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion in this melted pot. We live in time to build a new system. Unionize labor rights. Highlight the issue. Talking heads left is best. The saga continues. Continues. The No Meeky Show.